what I'm looking at right now are the first nine verses of Deuteronomy 10. Or those of you who know Hebrew, which probably not many of us, the name is Devarim, which just means words. Devar, Devar is word. Deuteronomy, of course, what does that mean? You should all know what that is. It's fifth, five. At that time, the Lord said to me, Cut out for yourself two tablets of stone like the former ones, and come up to me on the mountain, and make an ark of wood for yourself. I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you shattered, and you shall put them in the ark. So I made an ark of acacia wood, and cut out two tablets of stone like the former ones, and went up on the mountain with the two tablets in my hand. He wrote on the tablets like the former writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire on the day of the assembly. And the Lord, and of course every place we're reading Lord here, capital, that's Yahweh, gave them to me. Then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark which I had made, and there they are, as the Lord, as Yahweh commanded me. Now the sons of Israel set out from Berot, Benin Yachon, to Moserah. There Aaron died, and he was buried, and Eleazar, his son, ministered as priest in his place. From there they set out to Gudgodah, these are wonderful names, and from Gudgodah to Yotbatah, a land of brooks of water. At that time, Yahweh set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to serve him, and to bless in his name until this day. Therefore, Levi does not have a portion or inheritance with his brothers. Yahweh, the Lord is his inheritance, just as Yahweh your God spoke to him. So the beginning of chapter 10 clearly tells us something we're all aware of. The first time Moses brought the tablets down from the mountain, what did he find the people doing? They were worshiping a golden calf. And so what did he do with them? <laughs> he broke all the Ten Commandments. He certainly <laughs> broke what they were written on. You know what's interesting to me, and, I, and I'm not sure why things like this happen, but there are reasons, and that in the Hebrew, it doesn't say commandment. What does it say? Words. It says the ten words. Because this book is about words, and, and we've been talking about this some, somewhat. In fact, the concept of idol worship is posited as opposed or opposite to the worship of God because the worship of God is a relationship and hearing a voice. The worship of idols is creating something that you can touch, feel, describe, make. And what's the danger when we make idols? We make a God that fits what works for us, what makes sense to us. And God tells them a couple of times as we go through this book that what God is like, your God, that talks to you, that you have a relationship with him. But it, it bothers our human nature. We like to have something tangible. There's something about us that we would like God to step out of the closet and shake our hand and say, Hi, Steve, I'm God. And, and yet, if that probably happens, Steve might be a puff of dust. <laughs> and, but the Word of God is very essential to our understanding of Yahweh. And of course, here's just one of those words we're not positive how it's said. Most people think it's probably Yahweh. Some think it's Yehovah. I, you know, don't fight over that. He has a name. He's a God, Elohim, but this God has a name. It's a very specific name, but his name means his character and who he is. And so Yahweh has something to do with, I was, I am, and I will be. I'm eternal. Which is why in Judaism they'll call him the eternal. Because that's what his name means. I never wasn't. I always am. And it's amazing how 
Not everybody does this. People will fight over names when in the Bible a name is your mission. Especially if God gives you his name. And, and I, I thought about this. Who gave Abram his name? His father, Terah. Who gave Jacob his name? His father or mother, Isaac. God changed both those names. Who gave Isaac his name? God. That name was never changed. Abram, Avram became Avraham. Yaakov became Yitzrael. I mean, really different. And But we get tangled up in this name thing when name when we pray in Yeshua's name or in Jesus' name, we pray in the power of his character. We pray in who he is. If we know him, it really probably doesn't matter how you say it. And if you don't know him, it probably doesn't matter how you say it. <laughs> Remember when the seven sons of Siva went out and they saw Paul and the apostles delivering people in Yeshua's name? These wonderful miracles were happening. People were being delivered. They said, we'll try this. So these seven sons of a priest, so these are, co these are good guys. They go out and they try to cast out demons in Yeshua's name. And the man looks at him, well, the, actually the demon in the man, and says, Yeshua I know and Paul I know. Who in the bleepity bleep are you? And proceeded to beat all seven of them. And, and I bring this out because sometimes we get confused that it's how we say something, it's who you know. So when you speak in his name, it's like Yeshua said, I don't do anything unless the Father does it. I don't say anything unless he says it. And, and you become an ambassador. And this is very important to the concept of name, that name is a reputation, it's a character, it's, 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 it's everything who you are, or in this case, God, his name. And when, and when we take his name in vain, or when we do something that injures his name, it means that we bring shame to his reputation. Greg, I, did you have your hand up? I went saving by. No, I think it's really true. In fact, it's, it's one of the things, it's, it's why I, you know, I mentioned just earlier here, one of the things that really opens us up to hear God's word is the act of being grateful and thankful. And, and another thing that I think is very important, sometimes we will attribute, like this story of Squanto from 400 years down the road, you look at that, that's God's hand. I mean, to have a man who speaks perfect English and knows everything about the area, they're ready to help a group of people that had already lost half of them, we, we can see God's hand in it. But it's, have you ever noticed that when God will do something great in your life, unless every day you get up and say, Thank you, Lord, for doing that. As time goes on, you'll get to the place where that would have just happened anyway. I can actually imagine the children of Israel blown away by the Red Sea opening and then walking through, and then 40 years later, ah, it was probably a wind. It was, you know, any number, any number of things that we would use. And, and part, and just what Greg was saying, the act of being able to receive the word. And in this first part of Deuteronomy, we have a very clear physical picture. What is it? They're to make an ark. And what do they put in the ark? The word. They put those Ten Commandments in that ark. And who's to take care of it? The Levites. And the Levites aren't to own any, they aren't to have a territory in the land because the ark is their inheritance. The word, the, the character, the reputation of God, they're to guard his presence. This, you know, sometimes people, I'll hear people say things today with our New Testament understanding. Aren't we all Levites? Well, if we're all Levites, where are the Reubenites and the Jews and the Ephraimites? I mean, all of his body are necessary and, and, and they're all wonderful and part of each other. But there's a need for a group that carry the presence, that have the word. And in fact, if you go to uh, Leviticus 10, Deuteronomy 33, I want to look at this for a minute. There's also something about this passage I want to dwell on. How many of you are glad that with God we get more than one chance? <laughs> 
And you know, I heard a, a sermon by Paul Cain once, and he gave a, an excellent sermon that Paul Cain could wander a little. He's a very prophetic person, incredible. But uh, He said one thing I've never forgotten. He says, our God is the God of the second chance. And it's really true, and we'll look at that. Right now, if you look at Leviticus 10, verses 8 through 11, the nice thing about Leviticus 10, 8 through 11, and Deuteronomy 33 is they're both 8 through 11. Same verses. So Leviticus 10, Yahweh the Lord spoke to Aaron saying, Do not drink wine or strong drink, neither you nor your sons with you, when you come into the tent of meeting so that you will not die. And we don't know for sure what happened here, but it's a good chance that the two sons of Aaron that were struck dead had been drinking. Uh, we don't know. Nadab and Abihu. In any case, we know when they, were, when they were worshiping before the Lord, they were not to have imbibed any alcohol. This is a perpetual statute throughout your generations. If, if you caught that song that we sang, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, it ends with Leolam. Forever. Throughout your generations. That's the word that would be here. It's a perpetual statute, Olam. Through time. And so as to make a distinction between the holy and the profane, between the unclean and the clean, and so as to teach the sons of Israel all the statutes which Yahweh has spoken to them through Moses. So the Lord says here in Leviticus 10 to Aaron, it's your job to make a distinction between what's right and wrong, what's holy and profane, and to teach this to Israel. And it gets right at what Greg mentioned earlier. Sometimes we would prefer a God that we could fashion and make, that we could look at, when God says, you will know me through my voice. In fact, in Hebrew, and we've emphasized this, so you're probably sick of it, but it's good to remember it. And it's kind of in English. In fact, you have to remember that English is so indebted to Hebrew because of the King James Bible. Many people became literate through reading the King James Bible. So the sayings and the idioms of Hebrew became English. And in Hebrew, to hear is to obey. It's almost that way in English. And I mean, I've, I've, we've talked about this many times. If you are a teacher and your class is not doing what you say, you will say, you're not hearing me. They hear you plainly, but they don't hear you. And in Hebrew, the word to hear and obey is the same word, Shema. To hear is to obey. And so to teach it is this word to cast or to throw, yare. It's almost like to shoot. That's where the word Torah comes from. If you go to Deuteronomy 33, almost identical, verses 8 through 11. Of Levi he said, Let your thummim and your urim belong to your god godly man, whom you proved at Massah, who, with whom you contended at the waters of Meribah. And this is where the people complained of the bitter water. Who said of his father and his mother, I did not consider them, and he did not acknowledge his brothers, nor did he regard his own sons. What's it speaking of? It's speaking of the time at the incident of the gold calf when Moses said, Who is on the Lord's side and who stood up? the Levites. And they went through the camp very brutal. Those who were worshiping idols and carousing were slain. So he says, these people, God's honor was more important to them than anything. For they observed your word, kept your covenant, they teach your ordinances to Israel and your, law, your ordinances to Jacob and your law to Israel. They shall put incense before you and whole burnt offerings on your altar. O Lord, bless his substance and accept the work of his hands. Shatter the loins of those who rise up against him and those who hate him so that they will not rise again. And this word, like I told you, teach is yare, which is to throw, or it's lamad, which means to exercise or learn. And I think all of you know that in the act of teaching, one of the things we do is we try. We exercise, we, we train. You do something over and over. If you want to learn to play the piano or an instrument, they don't give you a hundred lectures and tell you how to do it. They might give you a lecture and explain the, the basics, the background, and they put the violin in your hand 
and say, this is how you hold the scroll, this is how you hold the bow, they'll make a sound, and they plug their ears. It's not very good at first. You know, my mother was the most praising person I've ever seen. She was just completely supportive. I can still remember the look on her face when I played Jesus Saves on the violin. That's when we thought the trombone would be a good idea. <laughs> Greg, you your hand up. Yeah. No, it, in fact, uh, it reminds me of a, a book that Jamie Buckingham wrote. And it says, the title of the book was, The Truth Will, make you, will Set You Free, But First It Will Make You Miserable. <laughs> and th there's something about, like you say, Greg, sometimes we, we read the word and we have a hard time accepting what it says. And so we try to rationalize. In fact, you look at our culture today, and I realize I, I appreciate the separation between church and state. There's a safety in it. And it's supposed to mostly be safe for the church. But, uh, uh, but on the other hand, we're constantly saying things like, we don't want to be limited or follow those old myths. Uh, and, and to save or to, to accept what God has said, it's very difficult for people and another thing you'll find out, you know, Thanksgiving will remind you of this, that oddly enough, what we eat all the time is what we'll develop an appetite for. And what you'll notice about kids, there are a few exceptions, especially there's something defective in my genes, I'm sure. But the little children that come out of my family, they are not born loving vegetables. Not even close. And you have to learn to like vegetables. And then you'll get to an age where you like vegetables and you like fruit. Uh, but you have to train your palate to like it. And the Word of God is one of those things, you, if you decide, if the Spirit confirms to you that it's true, the more you feed on it, the more you're going to believe what it says. The more it will transform you. And if it's something you just glancingly refer to once a week or once a month, it's not going to have much impact on you. Uh, go ahead, Steve. Exactly. Now, that's a very good example. How many of you heard what Steve said? That is really true. In fact, I don't know about you, but for Thanksgiving, I make sure I'm hungry. I heard some people say, no, you shouldn't do that. You'll eat too much. And I thought, what's the purpose of this? <laughs> but uh, it's, it's really true. If we constantly feed on that, that will be what our appetite's for. If we fill ourselves up with other things, we'll have no room for it. And one place Yeshua said to the Pharisees, he says, you have no room for my word. That's a very sad, but an illustrative statement. I want to uh, just take a minute on this concept of the God of the second chance. In Scripture, we find this so much. And I, I certainly don't have an exhaustive list here, and you might be able to think of some in fact, when I look at our country, I'm grateful that God gives America more than one chance. Because in some ways, I'm a little unhappy with what our country is doing. 
This instance here is a classic one. Moses comes down the mountain. The people are carousing and worshiping an idol. He breaks the tablets. And he, in my mind, he's testing Moses. I don't know. I can't think for God. But he tells Moses, he says, get out of the road. I'm going to destroy this people. I'll raise up a, a people from you. And, and Moses says, no, we can't do that. If we did that, what would they say in Egypt? They'd say that the Lord was able to deliver them to Egypt, but he couldn't take them into their own land. And the Lord says, okay, if you say. But I, I'm pretty sure this was a test, but it doesn't matter. In any case, Moses comes back up the mountain again, and God writes on the tablets, and they, he brings them to the people a second time. Because as humans, we do fail, it's very essential that we impart to people that they serve a God who gives them another chance. And often it's more than two. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just jotted some things down. Think about the way that Joseph's brothers dealt with him. Would you have thought there was any chance for any redemption in that story? They sold their brother into slavery, which really meant we never expect to see you again and you'll probably be dead. God gave them a second chance. He gave them a chance to be reconciled as a family. It's an amazing story. You go to the New Testament. Peter, when he's faced with really that time in his life when he could have stood up for what he believed, what did he do? He denied Yeshua and he did it three times. I mean, by the third time we knew this was serious business. He was denying. And then, of course, that's when the rooster crows and he remembers what Yeshua... I mean, it's a terrible... But what happens when he, he, when he shows up with Yeshua? Uh, and it's interesting. Yeshua says a couple things to him, especially in John 21, that indicates that he knew, he knew what Peter had done and he was inviting him home. In fact, that whole thing about, Peter, do you love me, had to be a bit excruciating. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but the fact is when we look at God he gives us a second chance this is very important I remember some people that I remember a person that was struggling with alcoholism and there was a minister that was trying to help him and, and the way he thought he was going to help him he was going to tell him if you slip again you're done but the trouble is when you tell somebody that what's the first thing they're going to go do what, what if you it's the that's God's place to decide that. And uh, anyway, in this particular case, the person did slip several more times, but they did eventually get it together. But I can remember thinking, and this we'll talk about this a little later on in this passage, you and I want our words to be like God so that when people remember our words, they've built something in somebody. They've added strength. They've added joy. If when they hear, when they remember your words, they feel destroyed or demoralized. Those aren't the words that we want to be remembered. And we have to be very careful. You know, this is a family time. As fathers, as mothers, people in charge, our words sometimes will carry weight we have no idea. We'll say something and people will be remembering those words for 50 years. I can still remember Sister Belva. I love Sister Belva. She'd come, man, no matter how she felt, she'd come and she'd sit right here on the front row. And, and uh, she told me one time she wasn't supposed to be where she could hear, but her mother was talking to somebody else. And uh, a friend of hers, and she said something to the effect that Belva is my plain daughter. And I don't think she meant to hurt, but certainly she didn't want Belva. But you realize Belva could hear that statement exactly the way it was. Everything was in her mind forever. And I can still remember her telling me and thinking, oh, Lord, put something over in my mouth because I know I've said stuff like that. We have to be so careful because our, in our tongue is the power of life and death. And, and, and when we understand that, then we start to understand that our God relates to us through his word. And his word is powerful and it. It builds up. That's just something that sticks with me. Another few examples. 
I don't know about you, David is one of those people in the Bible that is so incredible. When you look at the story of David and Goliath, and you look at the stories of the victories that he had, and, and when you read the Psalms, his heart to worship and his connection with God are so incredible. He commits adultery and has his best friend killed. I mean, you're like, oh, you know, if this guy was in any legal system, any church system, he's dirt under the rug. In God's eyes, he's still the king of Israel and the type of the Messiah. Go figure. I mean, it's uh, something that those of us who see the prophetic destiny of America, and in my mind, very connected to the nation of Israel, you see, Israel goes into idolatry and is scattered into the nations in such a profound way that Hosea says that Israel is not my people and not my loved one, and that they're indistinguishable. And in that place where it was said, not my loved one, not my people, it will be said, they are the sons of the living God. Say of my people, my loved one. My... I mean, God is so much the God of the second chance. He, he does things this way. Israel and Judah split. They got back together. And Judah went into exile in Babylon. They came back. You'll, as you look through scripture, this is a common refrain that he is the God of the second chance, that he's the God of restoration. And in fact, in Acts 3, when Peter, this isn't his Shavuot sermon, his Pentecost sermon, it's the one after, but Peter is speaking to the people and he says, the heavens are holding Yeshua, they're keeping him until the time of the restoration of all things as spoken through the mouths of the holy prophets. So that God's whole way of dealing with mankind is a second chance, is a restoration. And even the fact that Yeshua comes twice. That same thing. I'd like you to uh, go now to Deuteronomy 11, and you're, as you've been doing, you're welcome to break in comments, but I'd like you to look at the last part of Deuteronomy 11. Start with verse 26. See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. Now remember one of the things that Levi was called to do up in chapter 10 was that he was to serve Yahweh and to bless in his name. So one of the jobs of Aaron is to bless in the name of the Lord, in the name of Yahweh. Here in Deuteronomy 11 it says, I am setting before you a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I am commanding you today. And of course, we know, listen is Shema. And the curse, if you do not listen, if you do not Shema, lo Shema, to, to the commandments of Yahweh your God, but turn aside from the way which I am commanding you today by following other gods which you have not known. It shall come about when Yahweh your God brings you into the land where you are entering to possess it, that you shall place the blessing on Mount Gerizim, and the curse on Mount Ebal. Are they not across the Jordan, west of the way toward sunset, in the land of the Canaanites who live in the Arabah, opposite Gilgal, beside the oaks of Moray? For you are about to cross the Jordan to go in to possess the land which Yahweh your God is giving you, and you shall possess it and live in it. And you shall be careful to do all the statutes and the judgments which I am setting before you today. This is a frequent refrain in Deuteronomy. It comes again in chapter 30. I'm setting before you the blessing and the curse. What I want you to think about for a minute, why does God want there to be a mountain for blessing and a mountain for cursing? Why are they to not only repeat the blessings, but the curses? <laughs> I hope we do. While you're thinking about that, I, that's certainly... Part of it. Joshua 1, this is another very famous statement. Joshua 1, 6, Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and courageous. Have you ever noticed that in Hebrew, when you want to emphasize something, what do you do? 
you say it twice. And if that doesn't work, you say it again. When the seraphim see Yahweh, what do they say? Holy, holy, holy. It, it, it's emphasis. So be strong, courageous, be careful to do according to the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have, a, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Then, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Are you getting the point about strong and courageous yet? Do not tremble or be dismayed. For the Lord your God, Yahweh your God, is with you wherever you go. All right. What will determine if Joshua has prosperity and success? If he's obedient to what? God gave through Moses. Isn't that quite plain what it says here? And when they came to Yeshua in Mark 12, and they said, Master, you gave a good answer. What, what's the first, what's the most important commandment? You know what he said? Shema Yisrael. Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Now, you think about something. When Yeshua says that, when Jesus says that, what he is saying is the same thing that God told Joshua. To hear, O Israel, what are we hearing? God's word and God's voice. We talked a little about this, and I'm not going to get into it today, but Yeshua tells us to worship in spirit and truth. So you need to know, and I need to know what God says, but we need to be filled with His Spirit, or we have no idea how to apply this. Thus we find Satan trying to tempt Yeshua with the Word of God, and Yeshua quoting the Word back, because it, it's spirit and truth. In the, Matthew 5, Yeshua makes these statements about salt and light. He says, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? And the answer is, it can't be. And what's more, salt doesn't lose its saltiness. But guess who does? We do. We, but he, so he says, it's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled on by men. You're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Where he gave the Sermon on the Mount on that hill, there's a beautiful city right there on the hill. So as he said it, they could look over and see the city that's on the hill with the lights. There's no way to hide that city. Then he said, when you light a lamp, you don't hide it under a bushel, a bowl. You put it on a stand, and it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, let your light so shine before men that they'll see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Don't think I've come to destroy or abolish the Torah or the law, the Torah or the prophets. I've come not to destroy but to fulfill. I tell you the truth until heaven and earth pass away. Not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the Torah until everything is accomplished. Whoever breaks the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be least in the kingdom. Whoever practices and teaches will be great. Lest your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the Torah, you'll certainly not enter. You're like, Whoa, what's all this? Plainly, what God has told us from the beginning hasn't changed. What he spoke is still there. It has to be, we have to be sure that it's, you know, where are those tablets? They are in a chest. Where is the law in the new covenant? It's written in our hearts. It's interesting, if you look at a heart, it's a chamber. It's, it's a cabinet. We were talking about a cabinet yesterday for building in the sanctuary, but the heart has four compartments. And when you look at a heart, it says... And of course, when God says he's writing things on the heart, I don't think he means this thing that's beating. But in any case, it is interesting that where we feel, where we make up our mind, you see, I think everybody will understand this when I say, we use idioms and we're not exactly sure what they mean, but have you ever heard somebody say, I'm broken-minded? I'm so sad, my mind broke. Well, you think about it. 
or I feel that right in my brain. No, when you really feel, where is it? it it's, you know, it, it's, I, who knows exactly physiologically how it all works, but the word is written on our heart, and what God has said hasn't changed. I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O Jacob, are not destroyed. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. Yeshua, Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's pretty consistent. We don't have to worry about this. Why does God want them to repeat the curses? I, you know, I'd like to be positive. But I got thinking about this. And raising kids, one of the hard things you do is convincing them what Gloria said that you learn from experience. Because you know, the writings have this beautiful statement that says, learn of evil from the experiences of others. But in general, you know, there's a tree of life and there's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life is, dad said to do it, I'll just do it. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is, dad said not to do it, I'm going to try it and see if he knows what he's talking about. You, you, it's the knowledge of good, you know, check it out. We had a wood stove in our house for a lot of the years we were raising kids. I think every one of the children ended up burning themselves. I finally got to the place where I had hoped they'd burn themselves when the stove wasn't too hot because they would not believe me. And I, I've even had grandchildren the same way. It's like, don't touch the stove, it's hot. They walk to see if Grandpa's looking. Ah! You know. <laughs> but think about it. Is it important to know what happens when you do the wrong thing? It is. It's important to know it. We recite the curses not to be downers, but because it's good to be reminded that to walk in this way brings life, to walk over here brings death. I mean, it's like I have to take these training modules to renew my accreditation, to be an accredited vet, sign health certificates, do that kind of stuff. One of the uh, modules is on infection and infectious disease and how they're spread. And of course, what we learn in this is that there's a bunch of ways that infection is spread. Aerosol, Contact, what we call a fomite. Uh, I blow the shofar, then Steve blows it. That's, there's a, uh, vectors. In people, we don't have this as much in animals, a little more, but it does happen in people. In other words, you heard of West Nile virus? The only way you get that is a bug bites you. I can be dying of West Nile virus right next to you, and you have no danger. But if a mosquito bites me, and then bites you, and actually usually what happens is it goes from a bird to a person or a horse. In any case, we have all these ways, but we, we rehearse how you get sick. Why? So we won't do it. We rehearse why we get sick, so we'll disinfect the table, so we'll wash our boots. We do all this stuff because we know that if we teach people how diseases spread, they'll avoid it. Sometimes people don't understand. God says, you shall not do this. He says, because this will happen. And he says many times over, if you'll do it my way like he told Joshua, I'll prosper you. You'll be successful. You'll experience blessing. If you go that way, not so much. And the commandment to honor your father and mother specifically is connected with that things will go well. I have been around so many men. I'm more familiar with this with men, but I imagine it happens with women that have an issue with their dad. Something, and it was, could be the same thing I talked about earlier where maybe dad said something that was hurtful, damaging. It could be something. But they nurture this hurt and this pain and in their inability to honor their father, it doesn't go well. Nowhere they go does it work because they can't submit to authority. They're not good employee, they're not a good employer. They don't respect people in charge, teachers, law enforcement, uh, Generals, you name it. You watch these people, they can have all the gifting in the world, but it never goes well. Doesn't work because God's word says, do this, that it will go well. 
And so it's important, don't say overemphasize, but when they came to those mountains, Ibal and Gerizim, over here you say, blessed are those who obey his commands, who find that life, but over here it says, cursed is the man who moves his neighbor's boundary stone. Cursed is the man who puts a stumbling stone in front of a blind man. It reminds us what not to do. And there's an old, I don't know where this story comes from. I, any of you getting old enough so you have stories in your head, you have no idea where they came from and you may have made them up. <laughs> but uh, I know I didn't make this one up. But there's a story about Sodom and Gomorrah and there was a fellow that got up every day and walked through the streets of Sodom and Gomorrah decrying and calling out the abominations that people are doing and, and saying, we've got to stop this. And people would say, why do you do that every day? Nobody listens to you. Why are you doing that? And he says, I'm not worried about them. I'm worried about me. I'm worried about me coming to the place where I don't react with horror. Because the minute that you and I stop responding in horror to evil, it comes in and becomes a part of us. Go to Ezekiel 9. Yeah. And, and isn't that true, though? In fact, yeah, Derek Prince had a great statement that applies to all of us who attempt to serve Yeshua, Jesus. He said, it's fine for a ship to be in the sea. It's not good for the sea to be in the ship. <laughs> Look at Ezekiel 9. And this is... Uh, a vision that Ezekiel is having. And um, I'm just going to start with verse 3. Now the glory of the God of Israel went up from above the cherubim where it had been and moved to the threshold of the temple. Then the Lord called to the man clothed in linen who had the writing kit at his side and said to him, Go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things that are done in it. As I listened, he said to the others, Follow him through the city and kill without showing pity or compassion. Slaughter old men, young men, and maidens, women and children, but do not touch anyone who has the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were in front of the temple. That again seems kind of harsh to us, but what we were just saying, it's very important to not lose sight of the fact that some things are detestable. Would you agree with me that in the culture we pleasantly live, that there's an onslaught every day to teach us to accept the repulsive? There's a, something every day that's hammering at us to say, it's okay. A and then when we see the, the fruits of it, then we're horrified, and we wonder, how did that happen? I'll, I'll take a simple one. We are teaching our young people that if they, quote, make a mistake and get pregnant, the way to deal with the mistake is to remove the evidence. Then we wonder why in our culture we've lost a reverence for life. What, are we, what were we told in Deuteronomy 11? Therefore choose life. And that's true in every situation. And what I find interesting, I think you can overdo it with the grisly stuff. But I am amazed that there are people that want to stop us from showing people what happens to a fetus in an abortion. If it's okay, let people see it, right? But what happens when mothers see it? They don't want to have an abortion. In fact, another thing they don't want to do, they, they want to prevent these pro-life places from doing ultrasounds, where of course you look and there's your little baby moving his hands and his heart beating. Because suddenly it went from a mistake, this is a human being that absolutely has no reason to bear what's happened with his parents, his or her. And, and I just say that because let's be really careful 
to get to the place where we're hardened to what is repulsive to God. Yes. Yeah, and I, and I think that we do people a disservice to pretend that sin isn't harmful, don't you? To pretend that sin doesn't, doesn't hurt. And, you know, you hear people talking that they want to be free. And, and when you look at it, the legacy of liberty is what makes our country so special. But I, there's a little uh, apocryphal story that a fellow named Danny Litvin wrote uh, speaking of the freedom and how people confuse it. A man once desired to be completely free. He sold his house and went to live on a desert island. However, he was still confined to the land with its trees and sand and animals. So he became an astronaut and left Earth with all its confines. Once up in space, he realized that he was still confined by the space capsule, so he went out in his spacesuit for a spacewalk. Feeling confined by his spacesuit, and in order to be totally free, he took it off. <laughs> then he was totally free, but dead. The point of this story is to show that the concept of total freedom is meaningless as far as man is concerned. All freedom requires boundaries. So when we say we're going to choose life, that means we're not going to choose death. When we're going to choose God's ways, we're going to reject those ways that oppose Him. And. It's about time to stop here. Uh, I want to just bring out a little bit on what I mentioned in Deuteronomy 10, where it says, you're to bless in his name. And we've talked about this before, and I find that Thanksgiving is a good time to remind us that our mouths are to be used for blessing. And that what our words have tremendous power uh, Proverbs 15, 4, a soothing tongue is a tree of life, perversion is in it crushes, but perversion in it crushes the spirit. We've all seen that. A tongue that's not under control. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Our soul yearns for blessing. And I think if you were to ask any person they would say they appreciate and love. It's even hard to describe how our soul receives blessing. If someone truly blesses us. This becomes very true in the instance of a father, mother, mentor, someone who's significant. You'll notice that a lot of children, when they do plays, piano recitals, sports events, they'll very often look to see if their parent is watching. And if their parent is watching, they feel free. And sometimes not so much. <laughs> if, if the dad is too critical, I've struggled with a little of that myself. But, but seriously, and uh, it's very important that we have this concept of blessing. And in the scripture, we see Jacob and Esau fighting over the blessing. And you don't have to be really a scriptorian to understand that Jacob is a type of the spiritual man. Esau is a type of the one who lives for his flesh. Because when Esau has a chance of a bowl of soup and his birthright, what does he choose? And, and he's constantly making decisions that are immediate, that fill the second. That, you know, and, and then he regrets it, but he, he never changes. He marries the women he shouldn't. When he finds out that his dad and mom are just horrified, goes out and marries another one. That's not, you know, an Ishmaelite. She's not quite as bad a Canaanite. He's, he just doesn't get it. And yet, an interesting thing, when Esau comes and finds that Jacob has tricked Isaac, and I always laugh about this, and we all have our view, I believe that the words Isaac spoke came from God. The words for Jacob were going to come for Jacob regardless when, the words for Esau, I mean, you know, I'm not so sure we need to trick things to get God to work. I kind of think he has it in control. 
But in any case, Esau comes back and he says, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, oh, my father. And you know, as children, we fathers, mothers included, but especially fathers, bless your kids. Speak over them. Say, you're important to me. You mean a lot to me. I see this gift in you. I see these talents. I see the thing you will become because of God working in your life. Let them have words in their ears. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace, his shalom. That, that's the words the children of Israel are to hear from the priest. A word of blessing, something that lifts up. And, and another interesting story is Jacob wrestling with the angel. And remember, he wouldn't let go until what? Until you bless me. He will not let go. And you know, God loves that. He loves that in Jacob, that he will not let go until God blesses him. Uh, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. It, uh, and as we conclude here, I think the thing about blessing is it's not flattery. And I think we need to be careful about that because in every human being, there are attributes that we can bless. And a blessing requires prophetic vision. A blessing requires sometimes, and this is where I, I fall down on the job, Mary works with us dull interceding council members teaching us to pray and listen to the Lord, and I really appreciate it. But sometimes to, to, to make a blessing, and I think Mary has said this, take a couple days, pray, think about it, then write it down. I, I believe that a blessing can make all the difference. Because I, I remember, I've, I've talked to these, I've told you about these boys that struggled with their father. And one particularly, all he could remember, and I'm sure his dad said other things, but all he could remember is you'll never amount to a hill of beans. You're no good. You'll always be a failure. You can't do anything right. And that's, the, that's always what was going around in his head. And of course, the only solution to that is to forgive, to let go and to go on. But we have this ability to ask God for his vision and to speak blessing. And you look, one of the, the beautiful pictures of this is when the angel finds Gideon hiding in a wine press, threshing some wheat. And his first words, behold, O mighty warrior. <laughs> and, and, I, and it's wonderful because Gideon says, I'm the least in the, my family. But that's what's God's opinion. And as we close, do you remember when the angel came to Mary? And I love her response because I'm nothing special. And the Lord says, you're highly favored. You've been chosen. And words of blessing transform and change the destinies of people. And the true words of blessing that God has called his people to give to their kids, to those who they speak to, will actually allow people to move into the destiny that God has created for them. Because the greatest blessing is to speak God's words of revelation over people. Thank you. Let's all stand. <clears throat> Brother Gerald, would you close for us, please?